Hannah. I'm oh, sorry, my dog just walked in here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Huggy, do you want to say hi? <laughs> what type of dog? Oh, hey, my bye. days have has come so far that I actually had a pretty bad wreck a couple of weeks ago in California. I crashed straight into the wall, and um, as a Canadian and as kind of the underdog that doesn't come from money, uh, it's that's the main reason why I haven't quit, even though I went through a lot of hard times in it, is because. Welcome back to another episode of Redirected. I'm your host, Andrew East, and this is a show where we sit down and talk with people about how they made it through some of life's unexpected events. Today, we sit down and talk with Amber Balkin, who is a female race car driver, and Amber's mission is to inspire and motivate others to pursue their dreams, break stereotypes, and have a positive impact on society. And Amber shares her story about how she got into racing in the first place and some of the unique challenges that she's faced being a female in the racing world. And I really enjoyed this conversation. If you guys haven't yet, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and maybe give the show a rating. It is our goal here to help inspire others to make it through some of life's unexpected events and challenges, whatever those might be. And you doing that really helps us reach that audience. So without further ado, let's enjoy this episode with Amber Balkin. Amber, thank you so much for joining the show today. It's good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I got to tell you, I want to start off by saying that Sean and I kind of, my wife and I met at uh, the Indy 500 and that's where things kind of kicked off. No so, so racing is near and dear to my heart. It means a lot to me. I'm an indie boy myself. So the Indy 500 was something that we always went to. And um, anyway, it's, it's great to be talking to you. I'm pumped. Have you been able to kiss the bricks there? I've never kissed the bricks. I have, I, we've been on the track, but I've uh, never, never actually gotten down. Have you done it? I have. Yep. Oh my I'm gosh. Friends with Connor Daly, who is the president's son. And yes. That's fun, I should say. And a few years ago, we were there for a racing conference, and he said to my dad, you want to see the track? We're like, absolutely. So it's actually snowing at that time, too. So we were in a Tahoe going around the track with snow, and we are making wake around the track. Was- oh, my gosh. <laughs> Indianapolis gets cold in the winter. Wait, Connor Daly is whose stepson? Um, the president of Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Oh, I did not know that. So another fun story, Connor and I went to, we were in sixth grade together and we were locker buddies. No way. And I distinctly remember I was like, we would share, we were buddies and we were talking about what we wanted to do when we grew up. And I was like, I want to play football. And Connor was like, I want to be a professional driver. I was like, you're crazy, dude. You're out of control, but here he is killing it. And, uh, it's, it's fun to see what he's done. Um, where, so where'd you grow up, Amber? So I'm Canadian. I grew up in Winnipeg. I'm actually here now. I live in North Carolina. Okay. Um, my boyfriend is a football player as well. So he plays in the Canadian Football League. And unfortunately, he got injured second day of training camp. So he tore his ACL, LC, and meniscus. So unfortunately, he's out for the rest of the season. Dang. So he's doing treatment here. So I came to visit him for a little bit until he's a little bit more healed up to come back to North Carolina with me. Is he Canadian as well? He is. Yeah, we actually went to the same high school. And uh, we've only been together for two years, but we've known each other for like 11 years. So wow, unique, unique story for sure. That's why I actually love following you and Sean. Um, Sean's a, so cool, by the way. Like I've always thought she's such a badass, but yeah, she's... Um, you guys really remind me of me and my boyfriend. So uh, wow, you guys, it's cool. Well, might, we might be friends after this. Who knows? <laughs> what position, what position is he? Defensive end. Okay. Oh, nice. Must be a big boy. He is. He's a big guy. He's like 6'5", 240. <laughs> Dang, that's great. He probably doesn't respect long snappers that much, but, you know, um, that, I, that's okay. I feel like <laughs> athletes respect each other on some, some level, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think you're the first Canadian to be on the show, too. So really? this, is, awesome. this is big. This is really huge. Um, I understand you come from a racing family. I do, yes. So I grew up in Canada where racing really isn't popular at all, Mm -hmm. but my mom grew up in a racing family and my dad grew up racing. So my parents actually met at the racetrack. I've been going to the racetrack since I was literally in my mother's belly. And uh, when I was born, I was born into it and I loved it. I knew I wanted to do it from day one. All my cousins did it. And as a little girl, I just looked up to my cousins racing go-karts and I wanted to be like them and race go-karts and I actually had begged my dad for a long time to let me race go-karts and he didn't want me to because it costs a lot of money 
there's a huge time commitment to it. And, um, you know, it's just like anything, if you're going to go after something, you kind of got to be all in if you want to do it right. And so he kept saying, no, no, no. I guess the safety aspect as well, <laughs> racing cars. But um, I, uh, I just, I wanted to so bad. And he kept saying, no, no, no. And then finally at 10 years old, my mom said, you know, my dad didn't let me race because I was a girl and like, we're not going to do that to our daughter too. And so he said, okay, you can go racing, but there's some stipulations. And that is you have to not only pay for the go-kart yourself, you have to work on it. And basically you got to do it on your own. I'll, I'll be by your side to support you, but this is what you got to do. And that was 17 years ago. And uh, that's kind of been my life story is I've had to work really, really hard for everything. And uh, I come from a family that didn't give me the the benefit of the doubt when it came to finances. When most people in that position, most race car drivers, come from really wealthy families because it's such an expensive sport but that wasn't the case for me so I always kind of felt like I was behind the eight ball all the time with trying to find the funding to make it happen but at the same time this was my love and passion I wasn't going to let that stop me from going after it so I got a question for you love that story by the way I I have um I guess realize that racers do usually come from either a lineage of other racers or from a lot of money. Is that because that there's a, t a ton of money in racing or because racing is expensive? You know what I'm saying? Like, which is the yeah, result? Of That's a yeah. Good um, maybe a little bit of both. Yeah. For me, I think it was just growing up in a racing family. That's all I knew. Like even mm -hmm. when I wasn't racing, I'd be with my dad watching him race on mm -hmm. weekends instead of hanging out with friends at school, you know? So it, for me, it was just all I knew and all I wanted to know. Like, I just loved it so much. So um, there are drivers who have parents that were race car drivers, but they want to do something else. Right. Um, but it, the thing is, it does cost a lot of money to do, especially when you want to transition from a hobby to a career. Mm -hmm. So my entire family were... Uh, they were professional race car drivers, but they still had a nine to five job from Monday to Friday and they raced on weekends for fun. Um, you know, they might make a tiny bit of money at it, but uh, they got just enough money to be able to race on weekends. And then they go back to their job where um, I wanted to make racing a career. And I was the first in the family to go from dirt track racing where we grew up, that's how we raced, to switching over to Na the NASCAR side, the pavement side, which is a completely different industry. We're still going around in circles, but now it's more of a business than uh, something fun we get to do on weekends and crack a beer after. Yeah. <laughs> what is it about racing that you love so much? It, there's a few things for me. Uh, the number one thing is just the feeling it gets. To me, it's like a escape from reality. You know, hopping in the car, the adrenaline rush, the um, just the feeling of being in your own little world and nothing you're focused on nothing, but either passing the car in front of you or hitting your marks or getting, being the best and fastest you can be. And it's, it, I have a little bit of ADD when I'm not racing. So it's like the one area that I can really go in and it focus and I'm in my own world. And I'm, I just feel like a different person when I'm have my race suit on and in my car. And it's just an escape from reality. And as a teenage girl, um, school sucked, you know, bullying, all that kind of stuff. And to be able to go to the races and put on a helmet and strap in a car and not only do something I loved doing, but I ended up being good at it. Mm -hmm. It gave me that confidence that I was kind of lacking before. And, uh, like I said, it was just an escape. Nothing else was, nothing else matters when I'm in the car, but I'm um, just getting, getting to race. So that's definitely the number one thing is just the feeling that I get. And two, now having done this for so long and, and realizing what kind of platform it provides for me as a female and as a Canadian and as kind of the underdog that doesn't come from money. Uh, it's, that's the main reason why I haven't quit, even though I've went through a lot of hard times in it is because I want to show people that you don't necessarily need all the tools in the toolbox to make your dreams become a reality. You just got to work really hard. So I hope to make it to the top of NASCAR one day and, and just show people that, if you work really hard, you can, you can get there. So uh, I hope that um, racing is my platform to inspire and empower other people. Wow. What a great perspective. Um, I want to talk about the demeanor that racers have, because I feel like you have to be a little bit insane. So like when you talk, are most, are most racers adrenaline junkies? Like what's, what are they like when you're interacting with them? 
I would say so for sure. Like I myself am definitely an adrenaline junkie. Like I like to live life on the edge. I like to feel that like feeling. Um, I would say a little, a little bit crazy, especially when I first started racing, I raced on dirt and I raced these things called sprint cars. So they're um, 950 horsepower engines with 1300 pound cars, which which is an insane engine to car rate, like weight ratio. And they're so fast. And we're just ripping around these like right on the high side flipping. And I think uh, like I had grown men walk up to me and say, girl, you got some balls. You got some big balls. <laughs> and that, that was, but I look back at it now. I'm like, now that I'm a little older, I don't know if I'd still have the balls to do that. Like I think stock car racing is a little bit safer, but uh, yeah, I think it really just comes down to, it's all I know. I just love it so much. And the danger aspect of it just kind of gets thrown away. You know, I'm sure you can relate with football, you know, there's a danger aspect to it, but when you love to do it that much, you don't, you just don't really think about it. Yeah, I was about to say, I guess there's a little overlap between football and racing in the sense that you know you're kind of putting yourself in harm's way, but I, the stakes in racing just seem a little higher because the speed is insane that you guys get to. You said the stock car is safer than sprint? I believe so. I think open wheel cars in general, um, so Indy cars is considered open wheel car. Mm-hmm. There's room for tire hops and they're so light, they flip easy easily i think they're a lot more dangerous i think nascars or stock cars have a little bit safer of of an aspect to them also the safety equipment nowadays have has come so far that i actually had a pretty bad wreck a couple weeks ago in california i crashed straight into the wall and um, my neck was a little bit sore the next day but considering the impact that was made and the how damaged the car was i was completely fine wow i'm glad you're okay Uh, it's just kind of part of it you know yeah happen but unfortunately it's kind of inevitable in racing yeah uh so you mentioned that you had to work on the car yourself and pay for it yourself when you this this was like a condition that your dad put on your racing career i was listening to an interview (laughs) where you were talking about you had to clean the bearings and check the stager and i was dying laughing because i was like i have no idea what this means i know nothing i don't know that much about cars like i know pistons i know the axle you know the, the basic things what is a stager so stagger is the um, difference in circumference between the left rear and the right rear. It can also be the fronts as well, but typically more in a, well, in a stock car, I guess it'd be the fronts and backs, but in a sprint car, it's more so the rears. So think of a red solo cup. Mm-hmm. Is the um, if you just put it on the table and flick it, it'll go around in a circle, right? Right, right, right. Because the reason it does that is because one side of it is bigger than the other side. Mm-hmm. So stagger is the difference between the circumference of the left and the right. Gotcha. So the more stagger a car has, the easier it's going to turn into a corner. The less stagger it has, the more tight it's going to feel. So the it, it'll feel like the car is having a harder time turning. That's what tight means in driving, huh? Yeah. But exactly. does, it all, does it also mean that it's like, say you're at the Indy 500 where the straightaways are pretty long. Does that mean it's harder to straighten that out when the stagger is yeah. bigger? Definitely. If you have too much stagger, it might be harder to hold the wheel straight because the wheel or the car is naturally going to want to turn to the left. Very interesting. So that's why it's also so important for driver communication with your crew because you need to be able to relay the information of what the car is doing to your crew so mm-hmm. that they can make the proper adjustments so that the car feels more comfortable for you so you can in turn be faster. So that's amazing. And my favorite part of when I go to a race is to put on like the, uh, the pit headphones so you can hear the radios, yeah. uh, just cause it adds such a different aspect. And even if you know nothing, it's, it's cool to hear how everything is planned out and, and a part of the strategy. Well, as much as you can until the unpredictable right. happens, but from a, from like a layman's perspective, I view like a driver as it's cool to hear you talk about it. Cause it's, I think there's a miss conception out there that like oh well every team is comprised of at the Indy 500 like the big races you have this whole pit crew who seems to be doing a lot of the work as far as the nuts and the bolts of the things and the driver is just out here like turning the wheel um what is that like at, at different levels and how much involvement do you have as a driver uh in how the car operates Yeah, so um, it really all depends in what level of racing you're at and your involvement in it. Mm -hmm. So when I I started in go-karts, went to mini sprints, then sprint cars, 
and then onto the pavement side in the lower divisions of NASCAR. So when I raced dirt, I worked on my own car every night, like every day, um, because I didn't have a crew to come in. I, I had people that helped me. Actually, my grandpa was a crew chief of mine for a year. That was really cool. Um, but you you got to work on it yourself. You don't. It's you just got to do it. Yeah. And then once you get up to the higher end, you are you have an entire team that you have sponsors backing that are helping for their salaries and you more so show up and, and race so what you're seeing at the indy 500 is basically a sponsor comes along and they cover all the costs of the team um so that includes like the crew chiefs the tire changers the fuel men the engineers the driver they cover all the expenses and then the driver shows up with their safety equipment and says i'm ready to race now there's drivers that are in the shop still every day during the week with their crew learning about the cars working on the cars telling them what they think and then there's drivers that just come show up hop in hop out so it, it really depends on the individual mm -hmm. uh, i would say though me personally in dirt track racing i worked on the cars a lot more now on pavement these are different cars i don't i don't i'm not as knowledgeable with them I'm, every time i do race for a team though i will go in and and ask questions and try to learn more about the car but mm -hmm. i'm not as hands-on as i was previously yeah so, yeah that, that was a great answer thank you for for dumbing it down for me um so this show's all about people working through life's difficulties and a big thing for you and i think anybody who has ever turned on racing on a sunday or on any weekend um has noticed that there's not a lot of female drivers uh i read that you at one point were going into a circuit or a race with an all-female team um, which is very cool. And you seem to be an advocate for that. Can you talk about how being a female has changed your trajectory in racing, um, the hurdles that that's presented and how you've worked through those? Yeah. You know, I think being a female in racing, there obviously aren't a ton of us, but there's definitely more and more coming, which mm -hmm. excites me. Um, it's, I'm think it's amazing that I'm in a sport that I can compete against men at the same level. Yeah. Like, I, really feel blessed to be able to compete in racing because it's one of the very 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 few sports that women and men can compete at the same level like that is so cool so um i personally feel honored to get to do it uh there's definitely been hurdles and struggles in the past i mean guys race you different for sure it's undoubtable um and there are people that still don't believe that women should be behind the wheel at all you know, especially when you wear dresses and makeup and la eyelashes and, you know, you're certain, they think you should look a certain way or be a certain way because you're a race car driver. And I think that's been more of the struggle than anything is people telling me that I need to look or be a certain way just because of my career title. Well, it's like, I'm not going to stop being who I am just because I, I race cars as well. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm off the track, I'm Amber, I'm a girlfriend, I'm a, I'm girly. I'm, this is who I am. It doesn't mean I should turn into a tomboy just because I'm in a masculine sport. Mm. And so I think that's kind of been the annoyance of just let me be who I am. As long as I get it done when I'm behind the wheel and, and winning races and that's all that matters. That's my goal is still to win races just like every other guy out there. I want it just as bad, if not more than every guy out there. And when I put on the helmet, you can't tell if I'm wearing makeup. You can't tell if I'm a good girl. The the race car knows no gender. They just no, they got a driver in it. So um, I really try to put the female stuff to the back and, and not worry about it and just say, we're, you know, we're the same. We're all going out here to win. Um, I, I try to not think about it. it. It does come up once in a while, but um, I think what earns the respect from other drivers is, is good results. So I go out there and just try to be the best driver I can be. That's great. I'm trying to think of another sport where there is co-ed competition at the highest level. And I can't think, I, is there? I, I can't think of any either. Like even some of the random Olympic sports, I'm trying to think that's, that is so cool and unique. I've never, I've never had that thought, but, um, fantastic. That's, that's really, really cool. And for you to be kind of a part of that movement and a part of that is, is great. Uh, I was just, having a discussion with somebody about this whole uh the u.s women's national team um the the payment differential do you feel like 
uh, from a sponsor standpoint, it's been harder for you to, to, to get equal pay as men? Um, I don't think that's necessarily been um, something that I've had to deal with as far as equal pay. Mm-hmm. It, for me, it's just in general, the sport finding a sponsor, finding someone to back you is extreme. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So it's not a gender thing at that point. It's just no matter who you are, it's really, really difficult to find the funding to do it. Like I said previously, most people in my position or most people that want to be a NASCAR, want to be an IndyCar, they come from really, really wealthy families or their uncle owns a really big corporate company or something or other. So um, to not come from that money and come from dirt track racing and come be Canadian. Honestly, I think if anything, being Canadians hurt me more than (laughs) American companies are like, well, you're Canadian. Why don't we just sponsor one of our own? And then Canadian companies want to sponsor me and they go, Oh, well you only race in the U S so that doesn't really work for us. So interesting. So again, it's, I don't think it's so much been a gender thing, but just kind of, not coming up in the way that most drivers in my position do yeah um, but that it it's a blessing hats off to the sport of racing for the gender um oh, right. That's inequality right. not being there you i feel like to some extent and i think your website mentions this have attacked the sponsor issue uh by leveraging your social media and you've done a great job with that uh how has social media played a role in your career it's played a huge role in my career um i really don't think i would be where I am today without it. I learned at a young age that racing in Canada and the racing not being very popular there, I need to do do something different to get the attention of the big teams in the US. So I utilized my social media. I had a YouTube channel. I started doing some videos just on dirt track racing. Then I started doing a little bit of reporting where I'd interviewed different drivers. And really, anytime I won, I make sure I posted it on every platform I could to get the attention of the people in the States. And it worked. Um, the NASCAR diversity program reached out to me, saw my success that I had had. And if it wasn't for the NASCAR diversity program reaching out to me, I probably wouldn't have even ever assumed that NASCAR would be a possibility for me. Mm. Um, I went to school, I did kind of the normal thing you do go to college. And um, I did my two year degree. And after that, I went to university. And I after about two weeks in, I dropped out and had my aha moment and realized I just wanted to race cars. Mm. So uh, Again, social media, without it, I don't think I'd be where I am because it's allowed me to connect to people in the States. It's allowed me to open my mind to all the different possibilities of me as a driver going from a hobby to now a career. Yeah, that's great. So the two-year degree, you, you have your business degree. Is that is that that? Yeah, it's a two-year oh, degree. Great. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Has you feel like that's helped prepare you for uh, the sponsorship side of things or just approaching the racing in general? Definitely. Even though I'm a race car driver, I like to think of myself more as a businesswoman or mm-hmm. entrepreneur because though I get to be on the racetrack and, and drive, uh, I spend most of my time looking for money to do that. So mm-hmm. that I'm c- constantly in communication with different companies and different CEOs, people to basically help solve their marketing and advertising problems to fit in with my racing. So I'm, I just had a meeting yesterday and I was asking what their goals were and trying to figure out what type of marketing strategy we can work together to integrate my racing and their company so it can be mutually beneficial. So again, I think of myself just as much as like a marketing manager or entrepreneur as I do a race car driver because I'm constantly trying to figure out how I can provide a return on investment to these companies, but then also get to race myself. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a cool challenge. Um, so you were the first female to win, um, a track, uh, championship. Is that right? And in, the fr- in Canada, yeah. and, and the first Canadian to reach, um, a NASCAR series. Did I, am I saying that right? No, it's okay. okay. <laughs> to win a NASCAR sanctuary. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Struggle through that. Uh, you have a lot of accomplishments. But I'm curious which of these accomplishments you're most proud of. And it could be related to racing. It could be your academics, whatever it is. Yeah. um, Out of the races I've won, the championships I've won, everything like that, the thing I'm most proud of is getting as far as I have with 
the small amount of resources that I've been handed or given. Mm um getting this far has been so difficult but i'm so thankful for it because it's built me into the woman i am today and i've learned so much and there's so many things i wouldn't have otherwise known how to do if i if i didn't take this hard road and um i'm maybe one percent of what i wanted to accomplish or where i want to be like i have really high expectations for myself but the fact that i've made it this far without family funding without you know the rich husband or anything like that the, the fact that i've made it this far on my own with just the help of sponsors that i've went and gotten on my own that's what i'm most proud of just because i've known how difficult it is yeah that's great um i always love hearing about the team that surrounds people to help them reach success who would you say is on your team whether it's your parents your boyfriend um co-workers who, who has helped you achieve this level of success it's uh one is sponsors i wouldn't be where i am without the sponsors that have helped mm -hmm. me because they're the ones that get me on the track and being on the track you know then i can i'm a racer and i can use my influence to empower other people so the sponsors i think is number one number two even though my parents didn't financially support me they morally supported me and my mom is my biggest fan and um you know my my dad and i have had it, our ups and downs but we always come back together we're a lot alike which can be good and bad sometimes. Yep. and um my boyfriend my boyfriend's so supportive and it, it's been awesome because anytime i want to quit he'll tell me come on you, you know you don't want to quit like you got you got this and um the fact that he's an athlete as well our mindset is always on the same page. Like he really understands me. If I have a good race or bad race, he knows how to deal with me. Just if he has a good game or bad game, I, I know how to deal with that as well. So it's it's awesome to have him by my side and in my corner and constantly supporting me and, and cheering me on. That's great. Uh, what type of workout, do you guys work out together, you and your boyfriend? Yeah, we do. What type of workouts do you do as a racer? Um, so I actually do a lot of football workouts. Um, I have a trainer in North Carolina as well, and they're pretty much all football workouts because it's a lot of concussion prevention. So a lot of like neck workouts, um, core, um, stability, endurance, strength. It, it's a lot of the same stuff. He's a way more hardcore than me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> he's less, like way heavier. He's double the size of me, but, um, yeah, for the most, we don't work out all the, every day together, but we do work out together quite a bit. Yeah. Sean and I, uh, cannot work out together. It gets, really? yeah, we, we, we start getting at each other's throats and it never ends well, but <laughs> he'll get at me. He'll be like, Oh, I'll do this, do this. I'll be like, don't tell me. I know what to do. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's a lot more knowledgeable than me when it comes to working out. So he's always just trying to help me, but sometimes I'm just kind of want to do what I set out to do. <laughs> yeah. One thing that always takes me back is, um, racing is, physically taxing right like yeah. there's you sweat a lot and it's hard on your muscles in what ways is your is your body fatigued after a race my entire body's fatigued uh, especially the long races where you know we can be in the car for a few hours and it's mentally draining because you have to stay completely focused that entire time. oh wow marks and there's no breaks there's no timeouts you know you you're... you get a 13 second pit stop amber <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you still got to be on. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, yeah, it it's very mentally taxing and physically taxing. You know, I I think we burn like over two thousand calories in a race, and wow, you is pretty tight to begin with, and after the race is baggy because I lose about five pounds worth of water weight, and it's pretty much all the muscles you can think of, like even the glutes because because of pressing the pedals and the arms everything for me the thing that i struggle with most is the neck my neck muscles just aren't as you know big or developed i'd say as most men so fighting the g-forces but i actually spent the money and got a really expensive lighter helmet for that and that's helped a little bit wow. um, but yeah the, the g-forces are pretty crazy when it, you know you're you're driving you're trying to keep everything in place but you also are still trying to keep your neck up oh uh, that's crazy for yeah. hours right and if you get tired if you get physically tired it makes you mentally tired and it ruins your concentration so it, it's just kind of a big circle you got to make sure you're physically there and you're mentally there and if one of those two things aren't there then your performance is not at its peak 
Um, do racers are racers athletes? Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Okay, good. <laughs> I was curious. I've always been curious. I I agree with you, but I just didn't know if that's the uh, the verbiage used within the racing community. So yeah, I'm glad to hear it is. Hundred percent. Think it is. We are athletes. I know we're athletes because I put my body through that, and mm -hmm. um, I feel like I just ran a thirty-mile marathon afterwards. I got, um, just spent like I'm done after. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was watching clips of you signing autographs to a bunch of little girls after a race. Um, you seem to have a, a great voice for for girls who might be wanting to do what you want to do what is the message that you share with them to inspire them i just really want all the younger ladies people my age i want everyone to know that anything's possible and if you're willing to put in the work you can make your dreams happen and i really think you should just do what makes you happy and do what you want to do and what makes you feel fulfilled and, and excited and um just to reach your full potential you know it's just anything's possible and just go after it. That's great. Do you, are you a big uh, consumer of motivational content yourself? Like yeah. I saw you mentioned Gary V in one of your posts. Yeah. Um, I love Gary V. I love Andy Priscilla. I've got the chance to meet him. Um, I'm actually sponsored by first form, one of his companies, which is awesome. And I definitely consume I say their content more than anyone else's. Lewis house is another one, but mm -hmm. Um, there was a year where I lost sponsorship and I was kind of done wrong by a car owner and I went into deep depression and I would just couldn't get out of bed. I was, I didn't, it was bad. And, um, I started listening to Andy Priscilla and started listening to his podcast. And at that time he was using Periscope and started reading more, more motivational books and self-help books. And, uh, that really helped me get out of it. And now anytime if I feel that I'm getting my flow again that's kind of what I turn to and I just believe that you need to always keep around positive people and positive energy and in good things and um I think consuming that kind of content helps yeah uh I am pumped that you have a YouTube channel I feel like YouTube is such an awesome platform I would love to see I'm an avid k1 speed racer I don't know if you've ever been to a K1 track, have you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would love to see like a walkthrough of each track and how you can conquer it. So just an idea. I would definitely watch. There's one in Fishers, Indiana, which we go to like, I mean, I'll, I'll go there for hours and just go around, try, try to beat my time. It's such, a, it's such an awesome challenge to like try to shave off a tenth of a se second and that oh. actually matters at the end of the day. Um, yeah. I think that's another reason why I love racing so much because there's always different tracks to go to. There's always different circumstances. So you're constantly being challenged and there's so much that's out of your control. Mm -hmm. So it, it never gets boring. You know, every race is a new adventure. It's, it's, you're constantly trying to get faster. Even if you win, you're still like, Oh, like, could I got another 10 quicker out of there? Like, could I get yeah. the lead? Like there, there's always some type of challenge. And I think that's what I like about it. Yeah. Okay, so what, what goals do you have now for your career? So my goal is for uh, the next year to land a big sponsor, which I think I'm really close to. I've been working with one company for a little bit now, and, and they seem like they're, they're on board for the next couple of years. So I would be racing the ARCA series, which is an extension off of NASCAR. We still run at the same tracks, uh, but it's definitely considered a development series. So we'd still be racing at Daytona, Talladega, Cairns, Pocono. Whoa really cool big tracks and most of the races are the same weekend as the cup nascar cup series that you see on sundays so um it's a really good transit transition transitional um series to get to the top level and um i get to experience drafting and pit stops and everything like that where lately i've more just done the shorter tracks mm. that's my experience so uh that's my two-year plan my five-year plan is to be in the cup series nice yeah, for sure so how does it work? So you have to get a sponsor that pays for your car and your crew and all the expenses, the race entrance, whatever. And then, yeah. then you have to show up and qualify after that. Is that right? Well, no, essentially you only need a spot. You only need the funding to do it. Really? Um, they can turn, if you're a crappy race car driver, they can turn you away for sure. But, um, you know, I hope that my resume is good enough for the teams that I want to be on, which 
I've discussed with them and, and it's all, all good there. But yeah, it, it really comes down to the funding. So I need to be able to bring the funding and the team says, okay, like we're, we're good to go. And that's how it happens. <laughs> Do you have a special license as a race car driver, Amber? We have NASCAR licenses. Yeah. Really? But you can not have a driver's license and have a NASCAR license. That seems, uh, that so seems. That, yeah, it's actually happened. <laughs> I had a few too many speeding tickets and actually lost my driver's license. Oh. But I was still racing cars. <laughs> so Connor Daly is notorious uh, for not being that good of a, of a normal car driver uh, like, <laughs> for his life whenever he's in the car with me oh my gosh <laughs> driver ever. that's so funny um what are three things that you've learned over your experience that you feel like the audience might be able to, to learn from i think number one is keeping a positive mindset and perspective in life to gain your happiness i think that it's really easy to get down on your life, down on yourself. And it's really all about perspective, the way that you look at things and you need to have that positive mindset. That's why I'm always listening and consuming that content that we talked about because mm -hmm. you just need to keep yourself on that, you know, high vibrations kind of feeling. So yeah. I think, I think mindset and perspective is huge. Um, I, I, that's what I've learned definitely over the last, I'd say five years or so. Um, I think two is not falling into destination happiness where, you know, destination happiness is essentially, oh, I'll be happy once I, I'm there or I'll be happy once I'm racing for that team or living in that house or dating that person. I think it really starts with yourself and you need to be, learn to be happy with what you have, who you are, um, really everything. Just be grateful for what you have now to attract those bigger and better things into your life. And I really, really fell into that. You know, I was like, oh, I'll be happy when I win this race. And I wouldn't let, it was almost like I wouldn't let myself be happy if I, until I was there. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that's just not the way that you live life. And things can change so abruptly in life that if you have that mindset, it's, it's not going to be an easy road. That's for sure. Yeah. This is something I, I've, I've spoken on before, but it is, it's, it's such an interesting balance as an athlete to not get on this treadmill of, of goals where it's like, you know, starting out when you're a 10 year old girl, you probably just wanted to like your first paycheck was the goal or like just whatever to get, to get your first win. But then you get that to get to that point and you set the bar higher, which is necessary. Like you need to always be uh, aiming for more and maintaining that ambition, but don't get caught up in like having, reaching reaching the next point as determining your happiness so i think that's a, a crucial point point. and i adding to that there's nothing wrong with having goals i think having goals is awesome it's good to have something to strive towards but mm -hmm. it's just keeping that i guess it goes back to perspective of you need to learn to be happy with and grateful for what you have um instead of chasing it yeah 100 percent agree those two. I think the third thing um, would be, it's simple, but just do what makes you happy. Um, it took me a little bit to figure that out and it, cause it was really scary going after this big dream, but um, I'm really happy that I did. There's been a lot of struggles, but I think you just really need to go after what makes you happy and what's going to make you feel fulfilled and uh, not care what others say or think, because there's a lot of people that, thought that I was crazy for trying to go after this big dream and um a lot of people online now that talk so much crap and yep. um, but at the end of the day you just kind of gotta ignore them and do what makes you happy do what's best for you as an individual that's great Amber I'm excited um for what's next for you I feel like big things are are in store and I admire your perseverance I admire your positive attitude it's something that you know I don't know how much you know about my story but just like shipping away at the NFL for five years and never actually really making a living f from it. Um, and then ultimately, yeah, it, it works out. And even if it doesn't, I think good things happen. So um, that's been my story. The last five years I've put everything into racing and, and it hasn't worked out as fast or as great as I, or as easy as I'd like to do, but yeah. I'm just giving up because it's my dream and I want to go for it. And like a lot of other great things have, came to me in in the meantime which I'm sure you can relate to and on that note I am part of a tv show coming up in a few weeks 
Um, it's called Racing Wives. I'm not a racing wife myself, but I have a business relationship with Samantha Bush, who is Kyle Bush's wife, a NASCAR driver. And so myself and my boyfriend are on the show and it you get a little insight as to what it's like for me to come into this racing world and try to make a name for myself in it and the long distance relationship and the af being two athletes and how we make that work. And uh, so that airs August 2nd on CMT if anyone wants to tune in. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you for telling us about it. Amber, thank you for joining the show and I look forward to keep staying in touch. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on the show and say hi to your lovely wife for me because I'm a big fan of her. She's awesome. All right, we'll do it.